like to introduce our speaker for the last portion of the evening. And there's actually a, a lot to say about him, but uh, I'll probably cut this short. Uh, so this is Mark McAfee. He's going to speak on raw milk and raw dairy products. Um, and uh, so there's a lot here I want to don't go. So he's the founder and CEO of Organic Pastures Dairy Company, a leading brand of organic organic dairy products in the United States, serving 600 stores in California and more than 3,500 stores nationally and in Canada with certified organic pasture grade broad dairy and cheese products. He's the founder and chairman of the Raw Milk Institute, director and vice president of the California Dairy Campaign, director of the California Farmers Union, and delegate to the National Farmers Union. Um, there's a lot, lot more that I'm not going to go into. Go to our website at svhi.com for all our old newsletters, and you can see the full bios and uh, information on our speakers, as well as you can find past videos, which come out about a month after the video. We shoot it tonight. It takes about a month for us to get it on the website, but you can review this, and you'll see all the slides. We've captured the slides. They'll be in the video and in good condition there. So. Uh, he's also brought samples with him, so uh, I'm looking forward to trying uh, some of these samples. Uh, as I said before, it's interesting. There's there's right ways to do raw dairy and not right ways to do raw dairy, but uh, he'll tell you all about this. So please welcome Mark. Adams. Thank you. Thank you very much, Randy. Thank you. Thank you. It's indeed my pleasure to be here this evening to speak to people who are interested in these kinds of uh, approaches to medicine and health. I come from a paramedic background. I ran. Seven, about 15,000 paramedic calls over 17, 17 years, and actually was a paramedic educator for the health department. So I have a pretty heavy pre-med background. My wife's got a master's in nursing and delivered babies for 23 years, and I hang out with doctors a lot. Um, however, I'm an organic dairyman. Now, the nexus between organic dairying and doing raw versus medicine is very interesting. And I found, I found my place in life uh, when I founded Organic Pastures Dairy 20 years ago when connecting to, directly to people and answering and checking all the boxes that consumers wanted at farmers markets. Because when I met the people that directed me to what I wanted to do as an organic farmer, I asked them all the questions. What do you want your dairy products to look like? They said, non-GMO, we want to meet you. We want to be able to see you on your farm. No Roundup anywhere. We wanted to be certified organic. We wanted to be raw. We wanted to be safe. We wanted to be delicious. We don't want lactose intolerance. All these questions, all these answers, no antibiotics, no hormones. I checked every one of those boxes and what did it end up being? A whole raw milk. And so there was a lot of innovation that had to come with that to be able to do that successfully because raw milk can be done intended for pasteurization, which who cares about whether it's safe or not because it's going to get cooked, versus raw milk for human consumption, which has got to be impeccably clean and done in, in a different way. So tonight's presentation is going to go about 35 or 40 minutes, and I'm going to whiz through it pretty quickly because it generally takes a little longer than that. But you'll get the general sense that when you're dealing with raw milk in California with high standards, it's not the raw milk of the 1800s. It's literally cutting edge technology product, which is really, really awesome. So I'll start off by a great picture of my granddaughter, Tiffany, and uh, she's there with uh, pouring some raw milk, which she absolutely craves and loves. All six of my grandkids absolutely love their raw milk and drink it all the time, along with thousands and thousands of other kids throughout California. So we make world-class raw milk, and actually the world looks to California for leadership on how to do raw milk. Uh, we have two directors from the Raw Milk Institute right now in Great Britain training their 170 dairymen that do raw milk in Great Britain on how to do raw milk better than they were before, where they're having issues. It was very interesting. In, in literally 10 minutes when I was in, in Great Britain last year, we identified what the problems were. They were getting such little mil, uh, money for their milk that it was being pasteurized, the milk going on to be pasteurized, getting so little for that that they were selling milk out of the same tank to consumers that would come to the farm to buy their milk raw. We realized that they were using the same processes to serve people as the pasteurizer, and they're having nothing but problems because they wouldn't clean the udders and the biofilms were building up and all kinds of problems. They were not having a segregated separate system, which was specifically with clean udders, clean process, chilled quickly, testing, and to make a really high quality product for consumers. And that was the problem. So we're retraining 170 dairymen there. But we trained 200 dairymen in North America with the Raw Milk Institute, and we've got a little banner over here representing that. But you start out with healthy cows in the right conditions. And that's what we've got at Organic Pastures Dairy. We'd love to have all of you come visit us anytime you're down towards the Central Valley near Fresno. We tour all the time. We love people to come see where their milk can come from. Literally, right next door at Piazza, our product's being sold. 
We're in 400 stores throughout the state. It's very popular, even though it's very expensive at 15 to $16 a gallon. It's a medical food and people go to it because it's a medical food. So pretty powerful. You start with literally healthy cows in the right conditions. And remember there's raw milk for people and raw milk for the pasteurizer and they're entirely different. And that's so critical to not mix those two up. That's my son, Aaron. And we start with grass grazing, pasture grazing every day, but we do supplement on top of that to assure that our cows remain in really good immune status with good strong body conditions. Uh, we have a purpose-built milk barn, which was just uh, built about three years ago, and it was all of our 20 years of experience going into this purpose-built milk barn that has highly specialized elements to assure that we can manage the cows really, really well, and that they're safe from being injured, and that they're super clean, and that the milk is actually uh, segregated by batch. So we can actually do what's called test and hold. And we have technologies now that allow us to test each batch of milk and get data back in 12 hours. It used to take four or five days to get the data back from the lab. So now every day, twice a day, we have BACS PCR data on pathogens and coliforms. We know what's in the milk before the milk even gets to the bottle. So pretty powerful, compelling technology just available in the last five, eight years that's allowed raw milk to really take a new level of ultra, ultra low risk in terms of safety is concerned. Um, the cows are clean really, really well. You can see them there. It's a very lighted environment. Uh, a lot of water, we use a lot of water there that goes back to the pastures, but we make sure that those udders are super clean, super dry, and then we do pre-dripping, and all these um, uh, milkers are highly incentivized to do a job because on our cell phones every day, a Steve Jobs device over there, every day we get the data back from the testing, and these guys get a bonus for good bacteria counts. So there's an economic loop that goes on to incentivize that these guys do a great job in terms of milking the cows, because it's all about how clean the udders are and how healthy the cows are, which is then quickly tested to make sure everything's okay. Um, we immediately chill, we test, we use BACS PCR testing, which is very accurate FDA-approved testing technologies, and we have representative sampling. A lot of technology goes into how this is done. In fact, if you wanted to look at our food safety plan, you could go to the rawmilkinstitute.org and actually see it there, because we believe in complete transparency. In fact, a lot of people have gone and taken our food safety plan and use it for their operations, and we're okay with that. We believe it's kind of a humanitarian service to the world that, in fact, people can do raw milk well instead of cheating somebody of not knowing the technology to do raw milk well. Um, these are the individual silo tanks that actually hold the milk before we actually use it uh, on the farm. Uh, we get the test results back quickly, which is really cool. And by the way, over a 10-year period using the CDC data, there's been 82, well, this is over a longer period of time than that, but there's been no raw milk deaths in the United States in the last 40 years that we're aware of um, that's associated with California production of legal raw milk. There have been some raw milk cheese deaths, but mostly pasteurized milk deaths, and it's, a, it's associated with listeria, and listeria really loves a vacuum where you kill everything off with pasteurization, with high temperature, and you don't have any competitive bacteria or flora, and therefore listeria likes to take hold. The big uh, problem we have right now with, with raw milk in the last 15 years has been E. coli 157A7, and we have an excellent test for that to assure we do not have it in the milk, and we do that every day, twice a day. Um, we are listed by the Raw Milk Institute. I, I was the founder of the Raw Milk Institute, but there's 18 other farmers who are listed as well. And it's gone through an arduous process of actually having a, a written food safety plan and auditing by PhDs and people that are way smarter than we are to actually look at all the risks from grass to grass, from grass to glass, I can't even say that. Uh, from grass to glass, the entire food chain, we look at all the risks and make sure we monitor and, and take care of them all. Um, we are part of the raw milk research around the world, and all of our data is actually put into a database for uh, looking at what the data looks like when you produce raw milk in super good conditions. If you look at the top left corner, that's a good set of conditions for where cows should be. On the bottom right, that's what you see conditions more generally used for pasteurization, CAFOs. And so you don't want to have this kind of condition around your cows. You want the cows more in sunshine and grass, and that, this is the kind of conditions we actually are going to predispose to fewer pathogens. You may find them there, but so few, because it's sun-drenched and you've got all these good competitive bacteria in that kind of environment. Over here with antibiotics and hormones and all kinds of grain and confinement, you find all kinds of bad bugs. And you get that on the udders, you get that in the milk, you start having real problems. And that's what you find, that milk goes to be pasteurized, not for raw milk consumption. Here's an excellent picture of seeing what our milk filters look like. All of our milk goes through a cotton sock, a kind of a polyester cotton sock, to catch any miscellaneous hair or something might be there. And that filter looks almost new. 
It's got some butterfat on it and maybe a, just a miscellaneous little piece of dust. But we test those filters to make sure there's no bad bugs there as an indicator of what's going on. On the right-hand side, you can see that's a grade A milk filter from my neighbor's ranch, and they don't care because it doesn't matter. And why would they? You don't get paint any different if it's got bad bugs or not, or how dirty it is. It all gets pasteurized. So you can see dramatically that there is a big difference in terms of milk quality and cleanliness right where it matters, which is where the milk's being produced. Um, this is the product you'd see on the shelf um, in the stores. And I'm, by the way, I'm not here to sell a darn thing. I'm here to educate. And there's so few organic raw milk products to talk about, I'm the only one. So that's kind of a, you have few choices to talk about this because if you ask a conventional dairyman why they wouldn't just simply go to raw production, they said, oh, heck with that. I'll just plant some almonds and leave the dairy business altogether because it's so hard to do what we do. I am very fortunate. My son's got his MBA. My daughter's got her, her degree in marketing. My wife, our team, we've got 85 people who work very hard together. We've got a great team. And as a result, we can do that. Most dairymen would never want to do that because from grass to glass, you've got a lot of things going on. You've got trucks going to stores. You've got processing. You've got collecting uh, you know, your bill from the stores. You've got all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, that is just very complex. We love that. We enjoy it. That's what we live in. But most dairymen would not want to do that because it's so complex and has so many moving parts. So we don't have a lot of competition. Or we're kind of by ourselves. Uh, the farm-consumer relationship is really pretty powerful. Um, for all time, for 20 years, I, I've gone to farmer's markets, and we have farmer's markets here. And we, we stand there, and we, we sell, and we talk to people, and we hear a Russian accent, or we hear somebody from Eastern Germany or South America, and it's like, give me that product like back home. You know, he's like, yes, I love it. Oh, thank you, thank you. But you see a mom come up from America, it's like, I'm not so sure about raw. You know, is that the stuff to kill people? And it's like, you know, real hesitant. Aren't you supposed to kill it first? So it's like, like this, I love it versus roadkill. It's like this really interesting combination. But, the, the people from the Eastern European bloc countries, and I'll say that in general, they come up, they've got strong teeth, strong bones, look really good from Armenia, wherever they might be. And it's like, you know, it's the goat milk from Black Home. You know, it's what I grew up on. And they've got this little mild accent, and they love it. And it, you can see it in the physiology, their, their, their physique, of how strong they are and how healthy they are, because they grew up on this stuff, the raw cheeses, the Mediterranean diet, uh, the, the raw milk kefir. Um, and it's not our highly processed foods that we've been and acculturated to, to believe it's the only way. So there's a lot of educational challenges we have in terms of getting people to think about a whole food versus something that's highly processed. Um, we really talk a lot about the gut. And we have a privilege tonight to have a mom here that's breastfeeding her baby. And let me tell you something. This is really where the discussion lies in terms of understanding raw milk. Breast milk is raw milk. What is the role of milk, raw milk? It's the built-in immune system that did not exist before birth. When a baby is born, it doesn't have much of an immune system. It gets the immune system from mom's colostrum and all the biodiversity of bacteria, the oligosaccharides, the 2,500 proteins, the uncounted number of enzymes, the minerals, all the fats, everything that's in that milk brings on the biome, the gut biome of the baby's gut, the digestive tract, makes it be able to protect itself against invasion of bad bacteria. It's, it's literally universally agreed by most all doctors that breastfed babies are going to be the healthy ones. They're going to be the ones without ear infections. They're going to be the ones that don't have eczema, or they do, it should go away. They're going to be the ones that have less asthma and allergies, and their mast cells will be stabilized. All these wonderful benefits. Well, if you take that long list, it's almost always the same list you'll find on raw milk consumption, because raw milk and breast milk are very similar. There are going to be benefits to breastfeeding that you don't get from raw milk, like the antibodies specifically from mom, and the very custom, wonderful mom-baby relationship stuff. But 95% of those benefits are found in raw milk, when the mother stops breastfeeding, raw milk is the next step. It always has been for 15,000 years, until the last 100 years. And we said, oh, it's going to be cheap, or we're going to pasteurize everything. And it, what do you know? It became associated with lactose intolerance, the most allergenic food in America. And right now, we're having dairies go bankrupt left and right, because all this extra supply of, of milk. And what are people doing? They're going to almond milk. Or the ones that really know what's going on, they go to raw milk. They're leaving milk because it's pasteurized milk. They have forgotten the fact that they put something between them and nature and they've got a problem. And the dairymen don't know what to do because all they're doing is creating all this extra milk and wondering why people won't buy it and they're getting too little for the milk and they're going bankrupt. So the raw people are actually doing quite well because they're adopting different principles and they're going and embracing Mother Nature and actually having a product people actually enjoy without lactose intolerance, and without allergies. In fact, it's really good for asthma and allergies and really good for bone density with alkaline phosphatase enzyme with very high levels uh, in raw milk. 
So pretty powerful here to look at the gut and the gut biome and the Human Genome Project, which just discovered a few years ago, 15 years ago. Anybody know who invested in the Human Genome Project? It wasn't the medical community. Yeah, it was the DOE, the Department of Energy. Well, that's really interesting. Why would the military want to know about what well, was the nuclear reactors and wanting to know what happened to the, to the human genome when it's being confronted by radiation, right? And yeah, there was some NIH money, but it was very interesting that when it was discovered and announced to Congress, they said, yeah, 23,000 genes came from mom and dad, but boy, there's millions of genes where they come from. And it was literally the viruses, bacteria, yeast in the body that contributed the balance of it. So we really, really, really need to feed the gut good food so the right kind of bacteria grow and thrive to drive our immune system to function properly. And what we're doing is eating a lot of sugar, antibiotics, and all these other funky things that kill off good bacteria and make the biome go nuts, and therefore our bodies go crazy too, and that's not good. So if you look at uh, you know, the, the top benefits here, this is a very short list, but cow's milk in raw form, pasteurized milk, and all these things, you'll see that there's active, there's active components on the raw side, and that will be the same as breast milk as far as that's concerned. But when you start pasteurizing, they're either not there or they're destroyed or they're completely denatured in some way and no longer in the original natural form. And our bodies react to that. They don't like it. They don't like it just like uh, uh, you know, a tooth that's had a, a root canal. <laughs> you know, dead food, dead things don't belong in our bodies. Our bodies say, get it out of here, and they're actually an infection point and they're actually not something in our body like. Our body's constantly trying to get rid of dead things and unusual things, they want living things and strong things. So it's pretty interesting to see that happening. And there's a lot of people embracing right now the alternatives to milk, which have not undergone the generation by generation selective pressures of natural selection over a million years to make the optimal food for the next generation. These plant-based foods are done in a lab or whatever, they're made into, from juice, they're not that incredible immune system transfer food, which actually builds the immune system at all. So it's pretty powerful to see uh, how raw milk has actually thrived in the presence of pasteurized milk and being so uh, sensitive uh, to people's gut. Here's an interesting curve showing uh, raw down here, pasteurized and then fully cooked, how allergenic pasteurized milk is until it's fully cooked. This came from a chart, a, a graph that I saw off a of PowerPoint down in, in New Zealand, excuse me, in uh, Sydney, Australia, a few years back, uh, by the processing industry down there that didn't want anybody to see that uh, because they realized that it's so allergenic to actually process milk. Um, if you look at, you know, milk, it really should be plural milks, plural milk, because all milks are different. Breast milk, raw milk, cow's milk, goat's milk. You have to actually look at this very carefully raw milk that's carefully produced versus raw milk that's intended for pasteurization. You really have to know your thing. Um, but if you look at what we do and what any organic producer of raw milk would do, you look at it's not pasteurized, homogenized, standardized. Those are three huge things that happen to milk. Um, nothing's added, nothing taken away. We don't use soy because we really realize that soy is associated with um, um, isoestrogens and things like that. No pesticides. We use a lot of pastures all the time, which is the high CLA, low omega-3, uh, the, the good ratios and good fats. Um, CLA is really good as an antioxidant, anti-cancer. Uh, it's not associated with milk allergies. It's very enzyme active, biodiverse, as far as probiotic bacteria is concerned. We're on the pasteurized side. It's interesting that Rodale, um, Jail Rodale, the guy established the Rodale Institute back in the 60s, he said it's not organic to produce organic milk and then pasteurize it because raw organic milk is a living food. Uh, would you pasteurize a blood transfusion if you're going to give blood transfusion to somebody? No, it'd be highly toxic to do so. So we think of, of raw milk thinking more like a blood transfusion than some kind of a, a highly processed food uh, in terms of its total innate value. There's a lot of problems with pasteurization. It solved a lot of problems if you're going to do it cheap. Now, if you invested a little bit in, in making sure you have good, clean water, the right kind of conditions, the health of the cows, new testing, it's not a problem. But pasteurization causes all kinds of problems, and it's associated as the number one most allergenic food in America at the FDA. It's number one. So there's no reason, there's a lot of reason why people and the doctors are saying, hey, if you've got a dairy problem, just leave dairy. Well, people are, are leaving dairy and having all kinds of problems. But it's interesting to note that they're leaving mostly pasteurized dairy, but cultured pasteurized are doing quite well. Yogurts and cheeses are doing okay, but they've had cultures added back into them. They've had to lacto-ferment a little bit. And even though they've been pasteurized, they've had a little CPR put on them and actually done quite well. People can digest them and do okay with it. But directly pasteurized with nothing else, 
people are leaving that because it's so allergenic and hard to digest. It's good for shelf life, it's not good for gut life, and your gut is not a shelf. And so it's really key to understand that we are literally um, been partners with cows and goats and sheep and horses and camels for thousands of years. And you think about that relationship between us and mammals, it's really quite a special. Because I mean, prior to the last 100 years, we spent a lot of time starving. We were always trying to hunt, fish, steal, do what we had to do to get our food. When if you had a mammal and some grass, you ate today. You didn't have to wait for something to grow. You didn't have to hunt or fish. You actually had something to eat today. And by the way, that was called raw milk. And old raw milk was kefir, and really old milk, raw milk was cheese. And so you had food today. In fact, in Jamestown in 1630s, you had to have a musket, and you had to have a cow, or you were going to die. And so it was really key as part of even the foundations of America that, that having a cow was part of survival because you had milk today, you had food today, and it really alleviated the whole issue of not being able to eat the sun. You couldn't eat the sun. You couldn't eat the grass either because you didn't have four stomachs. But the cow could eat the, the grass, which was sunshine, energy, and you could eat from the cow. And if you got really hungry, you could eat the cow. So it was a really important thing to be able to have competitive advantage when, as an early settler in America. Uh, there's all kinds of goodies here. I won't talk about it too much, but it's a bioactively available food, just like whole food from mom's breast. That's the only thing that baby gets for the first few weeks of months of life until other things are added. You could survive and thrive wholly on it. So it's incredibly uh, reflective of the optimal food you can have, at least at the beginning of life. And then older in life, it gives you all kinds of other benefits. Uh, we'll talk about one of them in just a minute, but very, very important to understand that 80% of the human immune system is the biodiversity of bacteria in the gut. And inflammation is rampant in America today. And so we really need to look at our immune systems and decrease inflammation. Raw milk is very, very effective at decreasing inflammation and repairing the gut. That's what its role was at the first step of life, and that's we can also play that same role later in life. Um, here's some cool things here. Um, low risk, a very low risk food. Uh, provides value to mother and baby. In fact, if you're having problems developing enough milk when you're breastfeeding, drink raw milk in, and you'll have incredible addition of increased raw milk out. We see moms that are having a hard, hard time getting enough breastfeeding when they're pumping, going back to work and having stress. They drink more raw milk, they immediately, within 24 to 36 hours, start to engorge and create a lot more raw milk. So very interesting for breastfeeding moms. Um, nice, um, you see a lot of EG, uh, IgE immune factors in cord blood from moms that drink raw milk during pregnancy. Now doctors will tell you don't do that because they're concerned about listeria, but they're not realizing and appreciating that raw milk and listeria are not associated. It's post-pasteurization contamination that's associated with listeria. In fact, the European studies show that when a baby is born of mothers that dr uh, drink raw milk during pregnancy, they have resistance to asthma for life. Pretty compelling that you'd want to nourish that baby with all the building blocks of life when in utero before delivery. So pretty, pretty cool there. By the way, there's a chasm. There's a, literally an ocean between <laughs> the Atlantic Ocean, between Europe and America in terms of research. The European research is centered on the social welfare of nations and doing the right thing and figuring out the truth. The United States is all about grant funding to make money. And so we have a chasm of what's in information out there. In the United States, you'll find very few studies about raw milk. In Europe, you'll find 40 of them. So it's very interesting to see that big chasm in the, in the differences between the two countries or two areas of the world. Um, Gut-brain connection. We now know very well that the uh, neurotransmitters in the brain are synthesized in the gut and so important to actually feed the gut to feed the brain. And good fats are critical. In fact, we're finding now with the vegan thing coming on, which they kind of went from getting rid of pasteurized dairy and all that kind of stuff, quantum leap all the way over to, to plant products versus kind of lingering in the middle here with raw milk, um, that you're finding a lot of these, uh, the fats created that are needed for the brain uh, in, in children's development are missing in a lot of these vegan diets, really putting them in trouble. Um, we want lots of vegetables in our diet, absolutely critical to make all the, the bugs work in the gut, to get the bacteria to work properly in the gut, but you also need the fats and the proteins and all these things. It needs to be a well-balanced, more of a diet versus just all vegetable because you miss the critical fats necessary for brain development. And there's other things there as well. Okay, um, let food be that medicine and medicine be that food. Mr. Hipp uh, Mr. Hippocrates himself said that. He also said two other very important things. He said, do no harm. And he said, all disease begins in the gut. And it's interesting, a UCLA professor, um, Annette Jewett, who's, uh, Annette Jewett, who's a professor at the UCLA Weintraub Institute for Cancer, uh, challenged her medical students. She teaches medical school at UCLA. She said, if any of you 
can find a disease that does not, does not have some kind of aspect that doesn't begin or have relationship to the gut. I'll give you an A, it can leave today. Nobody can. Because there's always an association with something going on in the gut in terms of nutrition and what's driving the biome and the human genomics. So pretty powerful there. So, uh, you know, one of the things I found as a paramedic when I would go on calls, you, you're going in there and the person's dying on a couch doing whatever they're doing to have a seizure, having a heart attack. There are always a pile of medications next to them and you never find any good food in the house. It's literally a correlation I found time after time after time. Pile of medications, where's the food? There's no food. It was all about the drugs and, and the person was in the act of having some kind of a critical problem. And this is especially associated with chronic disease, obviously shootings and stabbings aren't associated with that, but there is a little association there too because the people that aren't thinking right are doing bad things. And when you're not thinking right, it means your gut's not doing things right. So there is a correlation between uh, violence and uh, shootings and stabbings because they aren't thinking right, but that's just a correlation. The bottom line is chronic disease is definitely associated with nutrition and the gut biome. Uh, first food of life is breast milk, it's raw. And you look at all the wonderful things that go on in terms of building the immune system at that beginning stage of life, you can take that list and you can let 95% of it is correlated to consumption of raw dairy products and whole foods, whole foods. What do I mean by whole foods? Foods that don't have antibiotics, less processed, don't have hormones, don't have Roundup residues. They're just strictly healthy whole foods. Those are the foods of life which build the immune system and nourish us. Uh, interesting to note that Dr. Bruce German, who's the, uh, probably the most foremost researcher of, of breast milk in the world, from UC Davis, just up here in, in Sacramento, um, he said, we must rewild our gut to reduce autoimmune disease and illness. In other words, we're getting more of a, more of a monoculture of bacteria in our gut. We don't have the diversity that we normally would have in, in, in more ancient diets. And we see that even now around the world where people eat more diverse foods and they're close to the earth. They don't have the chronic disease problems they have. They have other problems, but they don't have our problems. They've got problems of their own. But the bottom line is we can learn from that. So really, really important. Um, the other thing that Anna Juice, Jewett said was you have to have a load of bacteria and there has to be a diversity of bacteria. That's what differentiates stem cells to actually keep your bandwidth going in terms of your biome function properly. Pretty important. And breast milk is the gold standard for, for measuring uh, human nutrition because it was created by, like I said, the multi-generation pressures, generation by generation, had the perfect food for the baby to survive, or it died. So only the best made it. So we can look to breast milk as a really a good benchmark, and it's kind of important to see that. There's my grandkids playing around the mud out there on the farm. Uh, that's a couple years ago. They're out of diapers now. But uh, being close to the soil is not something that's um, particularly friendly um, kind of thing that we're thinking. I think more and more moms are trying to get their kids a little more in the sunshine and get their clothes off and, and connecting to pets and dirt. Uh, it's really, really important to, to do that. Here's a little closer look at the science. Um, you see all kinds of recovery from really, really bad chronic diseases. Now we're not talking about acute diseases like injury. We're talking about chronic diseases that are associated with inflammation and infection and your body's inability for the immune system to function properly. Uh, we have a website at Farmers Over Pharmacies. Uh, you'll never see anything about organic pastures on that website. It's all about interviewing people in their case study presentation about how they went from two weeks away from having a, 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 a colostomy from you know, having Crohn's disease and literally completely recovering in six months using raw milk, kefir, bone broths, and whole food diet. And these people are on Humira and all kinds of ugly things, uh, and looking, at, looking at a whole terrible presentation of what's going to go on in life, and they completely recovered within six months. By just changing the biome in the gut, getting the gut to recover, they completely recovered. Rama kefir was identified as probably the most primo, the premier product to do that because it has all the food and the diversity of bacteria together to actually recover the gut. Um, and the good fat, and the alkaline phosphatase, and everything else. But arthritis, eczema, uh, dental problems even, the alkaline phosphatase enzyme is really key to bone deposit. And then the good biology, the good bacteria versus bad bacteria. Um, so high CRP, C-reactive protein. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on there that are really powerful in terms of whole food diet. Here's good old Anna Jewett in her, her uh, thesis about this. She's studied millions and millions of dollars worth of lab rats to figure that one out. Um, and at, down at UCLA, great gal. Diabetes, stem cell differentiation, really key to the biology of what's going on at the bacterial DNA level, uh, which we now know. Uh, this is, if anybody wants to take a few minutes here sometime in the next, this weekend and Google uh, this TED talk, it'll change your life. Uh, this is one of the researchers uh, from 
the, uh, the whole Human Genome Project, and it, it's really powerful to see how the role of the bacterial DNA contribution is so high. Like I said, you get 23,000 genes from mom and dad, but there's literally millions of genes in your body, and where do they come from? They come from the bacterial role of, of in your gut and on your body, and they're critical. If you get rid of them, you get sick and literally die quickly, and you get autoimmune diseases. So it's really important to have good bacteria fighting off bad bacteria, and they're nourished by good whole food nutrition. And what I mean by that is not things with antibiotics, hormones, um, highly processed sugar, those all screw it, screw it up. You've got to get back to whole food nutrition, the farmer's market type food. So that's pretty, pretty powerful there. Uh, Dr. Bonnie Basler, uh, she's a, one of the research scientists back east, east in Princeton. Um, the stem cell differentiation, bacteria play a very key role there in terms of contributing uh, DNA to that, in, that transaction uh, at the, literally at the, at, the, at the cellular level. Uh, let's see what else. This is a picture that's pretty cool. Uh, shows pasteurized milk versus raw milk. Um, this is 4,200 times. You see the pasteurization, homogenization processes really intensively changes things physically. You can see the difference. It's really amazing. Uh, this has structure and function. The butterfat cells actually carry the alkaline phosphatase enzyme. And if you destroy that, the alkaline phosphatase enzyme is lost. And also heat uh, completely uh, denatures the alkaline phosphatase enzyme, which is so ant uh, anti-inflammatory. In fact, this, the recent study by Dr. Um, J.P. Lyles, uh, looking at the uh, French paradox in France. He said, it wasn't the red wine, guys. It was the raw cheese. In France, the, the French eat about 2.2 a, about a kilo of raw cheese a week. And raw cheese has a very high level of alkaline phosphatase enzyme. And his peer-reviewed studies show that, wow, this is a very anti-inflammatory enzyme, which has very, very good health effects on those that eat a whole food diet, like the Mediterranean diet, plus lots of raw cheese. They're not drinking a lot of raw milk, but with their raw cheese, that is their raw milk when they're finding this alkaline phosphatase enzyme. And that enzyme is completely destroyed in pasteurization. But homogenization doesn't do any favors either, because it breaks up the butterfat cell, and that's what's carrying that enzyme. So pretty powerful and compelling evidence there. Uh, big studies done in Europe, like I said, that's where the work's being done. But I mean, Parsifal study, Gabriel study, all three of these show that the children that drink raw milk literally have a massive decrease in asthma and allergies and eczema. And then you look down at the LMU study, that showed the ear infections were dramatically reduced. All of these functions are related to inflammation and they're related to infection and chronic disease and, and functioning, um, functioning immune systems. The French paradox we just talked about, and then a cow share program showed lactose intolerance being dramatically less in those that have uh, raw milk because the lactobacillus bacteria, coliform bacteria, and the biodiversity bacteria found in raw milk actually, when it reaches the gut, creates the lactase enzyme for you in the gut. It's not that there's no lactase there, there is lactase, but the good bacteria found in the raw milk actually inoculate the gut, recolonize the gut, and allow the con consumption and digestion of lactose. So, very few people have lactose intolerance with raw milk. Good stuff there, we've talked about already. And finding our products that are next door, they're all over the place. If you want to find them, you'll have them. We also have some samples here tonight. Um, we're being embraced across the United States. If you look at other states, there's a few states that allow the sale of raw milk. Other states, you have to go to the farm or it's illegal. And what people are finding is they want their raw milk, but they can't get it. But raw cheese is now being asked for more than anything, kind of a French paradox being transported to the United States. So people are looking for yogurts and cheeses, and our cheese has gone crazy with thousands of stores wanting it. In fact, we're constantly trying to make, just play catch up to, to make enough cheese for the people that want it in truly raw form. It's not been pasteurized a little bit or somebody cheated. This is the raw thing, and people want it because it really makes a big difference to their gut. So uh, our cheeses are found all over the United States now. What about yogurt? Yogurt, you have to pasteurize it technically. Uh, we make a kefir, which is like yogurt, kind of. Uh, yogurt has four or five different kinds of bacteria. Kefir may have 150 at extremely high levels. So pre-digested for you with biodiversity. It's very powerful health food. Um, any questions you might have? I think I got my time in just about right. Just yes, please. Uh, Western Pride, amazing. Yes. By the way, amazing presentation. Just wanna add Western Pride, who's a father of biological diversity, he is so pro-romulus. Huge. You're absolutely right, doctor, exactly. And it, it's amazing when you fix the gut, you nourish the body, 
you have prevented a lot of problems by doing just that. We have screwed up so badly by not doing just that principled thing, the beginning, uh, that we now find ourselves in a place like, we need so much health insurance at home. It's like totally unsustainable. In 1962, we were spending 6% of our gross national product on our health industry. Now we're at 22%. So we're going the wrong way really fast, and we need to get back to farmer's markets and back to whole food nutrition. We need doctors and we need drugs, but we need a lot less of them. We need to prevent them, but we can't afford any of it. Yes? I think you said you can find your product at the office. Yeah. So um, milk usually comes with a pre-processed date. So, uh, what is it? Here it is. And Magically. Like drop dead date or something? No, actually, it's a living food. So yeah. I could ferment this tomorrow by leaving it out in a warm environment tonight. Or I could keep it really cold, like 34 degrees, and it would last three weeks. This milk comes out of the cow very clean. It's kept very clean and very, very cold and tested. So it gets a nice two and a half, three, day, three weeks of shelf life. In fact, sometimes it's got a longer shelf life than pasteurized before it starts to change flavor a little bit. But it's all about growing bacteria. Raw milk bacteria, just like bacteria in your body, double every 22 minutes. Your, your bacteria double fast like this. A body, it fast, it replicates. The biofilms in your teeth, boom, boom, better brush your teeth, right? The bottom line is bacteria live quickly. Uh, they, they duplicate quickly, especially at body temperature. Well, this is not body temperature. This is cold, 34 degrees. So if you let it get body temperature, it's going to, whatever bacteria is there, the good bacteria that could be tested for the bad stuff, it's going to start replicating, trying to become kefir. And then that kefir, you can put it through a cheesecloth and you make cheese out of it. So there's actually lots of value to that, but it's not fresh milk anymore. So it's all about keeping it cold. Yes? So um, there's two questions. One, uh, so lactose sensitivity is often also linked to A1 protein sensitivity? Not necessarily. No. A1, A2 is a whole different discussion. I could probably touch on it a little bit. There's a big, interesting Polish study that came out on that. Um, A2 Corporation's done a great job of promoting the A2, A1 thing. But a cute little story tells the whole story, I think. Uh, in Oregon, there was a small cow share that bought a bunch of cows saying, oh, we're so happy to be doing raw milk, and it's all A2 because we got all these jerseys. And everybody loves it, loves it. Well, two years later, she tested all the cows, and only one of the five that she had, one of the five, so 20%, were actually A2. They were all raw and A1, but everybody was saying, oh my gosh, it's just fun. So they were actually talking about A2, but in fact in raw form. And the Polish study that came out showed that, in fact, when you pasteurize, it does have an effect. That in fact, the A2 um, uh, uh, protein, the 67th allele of fatty acid, or uh, amino acid, has actually expresses itself differently when pasteurized than it does in raw form. And so it's, it's, the raw needs to be thought of in terms of the complexity of the changes that occur with heat. So we have about 85% of our cows A2, but we actually decided not to go with 100%. The reason was, Mother Nature makes very few errors. There's a reason for A1, and it has to do with the, um, uh, the feel-good part. The casomorphine actually makes you feel good. And if you eliminate that, uh, you don't have that effect of feeling good with dairy products. So there's a other compounding problem, which I'm sure the doctors could really appreciate, leaky gut syndrome, big time problem. It compounds everything we've talked about tonight because even raw milk and its proteins can get through the wall if you've got leaky gut syndrome. But raw milk's really good at fixing leaky gut. So you've got chicken and egg problems like you can't believe because we've all got leaky gut. That's correct. Especially if you take baby steps and you uh, allow yourself to eat a whole food diet, Give yourself some time, acclimate, recolonize your gut, and take it slowly. It took a while to get to where you are. It took a while to get, get out of it. So take some time and think about healing yourself as that process. But very few people actually express lactose intolerance. There are other sensitivities to milk that are not associated with sugar, by the way. There's casein and other things to concern yourself. But think about leaky gut. Because if you've got an open sieve in your gut and everything's going to the blood system, you start reacting to it, it doesn't matter what you're eating. You've got a, you've got a leaky gut. But if you're eating things like uh, the long chain or the short chain fatty acid producing uh, the, the onions and the, all that wonderful list we saw up there today, it was really gut biome friendly foods. You start healing up the, the lower intestine and giving them something to eat. Um, and you start getting the butyric acids to function and villi being regrown. Then you have a mucus layer and things start to work right. And then you can eat anything you want in terms of whole food nutrition. But initially, it's a sensitive walk in the park. It's not easy, a minefield, right? Uh, so you have to be cautious about that, and you may have to not eat certain foods to be able to recover your gut and then uh, do, do other things later. So the second question to Keith here, he mentioned, I love, I love Keith here, so uh, 
You have the right accent. You go with it there. <laughs> kefir is made from raw milk. That's the definition of kefir. Is, yeah, you can make kefir from pasteurized milk, but it's not the original kefir. So I give it my grandkids yeah, good for you. They crave it. They crave it. They love it. They it. Yes, they do. Now, the original kefir made, uh, is made from kefir, gra kefir grains, which is a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast, about 30% yeast, 70% ba bacteria, and they live on lactose sugar. So they wonderfully, they live in, and they build this colony of a very fermented, a very biodiverse food, uh, which goes back for thousands of, I don't know how many thousands, it goes out a long time, let's put it that way. Yes, it's very powerful, yes. But the raw side, in my opinion, is much more profound than the pasteurized because you've changed everything. Your enzymes are gone, uh, bacteria are dead, um, proteins are, you know, everything's, do it in raw form from a clean dairy, uh, whether it's ours or somebody else, whatever. The bottom line is raw kefir is a fantastic gut feeling food. It has been for a long, long time. Yes. No. Nope. nope. Your belly will warm it. Uh, this is meant to be consumed cold, or you can warm it up if you want. But the bottom line is don't heat it. If you want to do that, just buy pasteurized. We hear from our Indian community that when they're in India, they, they get raw milk and then they cook it. That's because of tuberculosis, and they're very concerned about that. And I appreciate that, because you don't have any controls of the cow's health. You end up with tuberculosis. That's a bad thing. But that has to do with the health of the cows. We have a tuberculosis-free um, state, and we can test for all these things. So we're actually able to do raw versus having to be concerned about some zoonotic disease that might get you, like, like a cow illness we don't, we don't have. Yes, ma'am? Has your daughter endorsed a crazy cow? Uh-huh. How do you convince them to? You don't, you don't convince them, you educate them. Okay. And it's not easy, because they're probably listening to their doctors, uh, and the doctors are freaked out, but if they went to a different doctor that said, listen, let's look at the studies, look at PubMed, look at these things, and, and make it their choice, and if they realized and appreciated the only thing they should worry about is listeria, and it's not found in raw milk, because we test for it, number one. And number two, the biome of raw milk does not have a history of supporting listeria. Post-pasteurization contamination has killed a lot of people, and I totally agree on that side. But it's not been raw milk. It's not been raw milk. Uh, yes, you go to the uh, uh, Raw Milk Institute. It's got all the studies. It's got everything there. And by the way, children that are born of ch uh, uh, from mothers that drink raw milk thrive. They thrive. They do well, and they're going to get their mom's breast milk, and then they're going to go on to raw milk after that. That's the building blocks of a really strong immune system, which will give gifts for life. I think that's about it. Yeah, let's, let's, let's You have one more there? You're sneaking a question real quick. What kind of cow? You have Jersey, Guernsey? We have 10 different kinds of cows. Jersey, Holsteins, uh, Belted Dutch. We've got crosses between them. We've got every. We believe in diversity, and it works really, really well because in organic dairy, you can't use antibiotics. So we want the strength of hybrid breeding. When we mix them together, you get a much stronger cow. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Nobody went to sleep. Good.